So who likes to go to the movies? Who here likes to go to the movies, right? I know we need to be careful of what we watch, but movies are fun. Who are some of your favorite actors? Tom Cruise is your, one of your favorite actors? All right. Uh, who, Kevin Hart, all right. Wow, I didn't expect some of those reactions. Um, all right, w one more here. Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds, he's pretty funny. Okay, so you guys have some favorite actors. Um, would it be safe to say that the different movies they're in, they play different roles and act out different characters? Yes? Different, different movies, these actors, same person is acting out a different character. And they make you believe something that they're not. That's the, that's the role of an actor, they're acting. And if you were to meet that actor in person, you would probably expect them to be even a little bit different. So in a similar way this morning, our passage is gonna reveal the difference between what it looks like to be a Christian or just someone who's acting like a Christian and what role the Holy Spirit plays in all of this. And at the end of my message today, the Word of God is gonna ask you to decide which role you're gonna play. You will need to decide how you will walk. So open up your Bibles to Acts 4, verse 32. 432. And while you're turning there, I want to get you caught up uh, as to what's been happening in the book of Acts so far before we get to this story. Yeah, you can see that, that Acts is really a story of the beginning of the church. In the beginning of chapter 1, we actually see Jesus after his death and resurrection gathering the apostles together and giving them one final instruction. In Acts chapter, are you guys uh, still flipping to Acts chapter 4, right? And so, and Jesus says this, uh, it says this in Acts chapter 1, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they'd come together, they asked them, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus repeats the promise that he's given. I'm going to fix this real quick. Because it's going to bug me. Okay. Jesus repeats the promise that he's given them back in the Gospel of John. John uh, 14, 16 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. So after Jesus instructs, the, this is in the book of Acts, after Jesus instructs them, then he ascends to heaven. He's gone. And, and right after this, we see the disciples praying. They replace Judas. Then the day of Pentecost comes, and the Holy Spirit comes on them in a mighty way. And then they begin to speak in languages they don't know, and, and others are listening to them, and they can understand them. And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, preaches a powerful message about Jesus and calls people to repent and be baptized and they will receive the Holy Spirit. Many people are believing. And as you learned last week, jo uh, Peter and John healed a lame beggar. And then preach, uh, Peter preaches another sermon and more people get saved and then Peter and John get thrown in jail. There's a massive amount of things going on in Jerusalem after Jesus has died and ascended. And it's all powered by the Holy Spirit who was bringing signs and wonders. And this was a big deal. Uh, and if you guys can look down in Acts chapter 4, verse 31 says this. And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. They had great power from the Holy Spirit. So that brings us to today's passage. Are you guys all in Acts 4.32? Good. And we're going to start reading uh, right there at the top. 
So now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said, and no one said that, they, that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as if as they had need. Thus Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. That's through verse 37. So this seems pretty crazy, right? They were selling all that they had and taking care of each other. And it says that there was not a needy person among them. And what does verse 32 say about how they were joined together? Who can tell me? 432, what does it say? You guys are quiet today. Acts 4.32, they were joined with one heart and one soul. It's a little late. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, so they didn't care about their possessions. They only cared about one another. And, and what do you think caused these people to have radical lifestyle changes? What do you think caused that? The Holy Spirit, Exactly. So that's what caused them to sell all their possessions and take this money and give it to people in need in the church. Just like we read at the beginning of Acts, right? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Just as Jesus promised the apostles in the book of Acts, or in the book of John, he would send the helper The reason for the change in these people, the reason they wanted to sell everything was because now the Holy Spirit had given them the power and the desire to do it. You see, when a person believes in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus and repents of their sin, something crazy happens in their life. Their desires change. They stop looking at themselves and start looking to the interest of others. They're united together for one common cause because of the change that's happened in their life. They now have the Holy Spirit living inside of them, and that's where their change comes from. Guys, we need to, point number one, learn to radically meet the needs of others. You see... A person that's repented and believed in Jesus and repented of their sins, you'll have the same power and same change in your life that these early believers did. In fact, the evidence that you're a believer, this is evidence that someone is a Christian, that you'll have love for one another. This is one of the evidence. In John, uh, in John chapter 13, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. But you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is a command that Jesus gives to to believers. And this should be a test for you and me. Do you have love for others, for other believers? If not, you might want to really question... If you're a follower of Christ or not, does this mean you should go out today and sell your bike or video games and give all your money away to someone who needs it? Do you think it means that? Maybe or or maybe not. I mean, this is something for, for you to decide in your heart or pray about or talk to your parents about. But you should be willing to want to be giving and do things for others. I mean, I, I do know this, that if you're a Christian... You should love other believers and look to put their needs before your own. Philippians 2 says this, it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others 
more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but to the interest of others, having this mind among yourself, which is in Christ Jesus. Does that look pretty radical to you, to be putting others in front of yourself? Do you think that the world looks that way? You know, it doesn't, right? And this is how a person who's changed by the Holy Spirit, this is how they're going to live. This is how their life should look. The Holy Spirit is, is the person who puts, who, who gives this love to believers for others. The Holy Spirit is who unites believers. The Holy Spirit helps us to live radically by meeting the needs of others before ourselves. So guys, we do. We need to learn to radically meet the needs of others through the power of the Holy Spirit within us. So let's keep moving on in our story. Back in um, Acts chapter 5, verse 1, it says this. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? After, all, after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose up and wrapped him and carried him out of the and buried him. And after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her, her husband. Now how's that for a story, guys? Talk about your plot twists. Uh, it looks a little bit similar to the end of chapter 4, where uh, Barnabas care, uh, sells a piece of land and gives it to the apostles, right? But we see this guy Ananias and his wife Sapphira selling a piece of land and giving some of the money to the apostles, but also keeping some for himself. Notice he doesn't give it all away, but he selfishly keeps some of it. It was his land, right? He could do with, do with it what he wanted. He didn't have to sell it. He didn't have to give the money to the poor, to the needy, but he was being deceitful. He wanted to look good in front of all, all the other people. And Peter even says to him, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself some of the proceeds of the land? Peter's just pointing out his deceit. But there's something really important I want you guys to really notice here. Look down at the last sentence in uh, chapter 5, verse 4. All right. Who does it say that Peter lied, uh, that Ananias lied to. Look at, look at uh, verse 4. Yes, he lied to God, right? He just said that Ananias was lying to the Holy Spirit in verse 3, and now he says Ananias is lying to God. What do you guys think this means? He lied to the Holy Spirit and he lied to God. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> there, there's two statements there, two different statements. Guys, this is super important, and we need to grasp this. The Holy Spirit is God. You can write that down on your paper. If you didn't know that already, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God living inside the follower of Christ. Remember, We've read this already, we've talked about it, that Jesus promised to his disciple, disciples another helper. The Holy Spirit is none other than the Spirit of God living inside the believer. Now listen up, guys, listen up. We know that God the Father is God, right? 
Yes, God is God. So Jesus, as we've learned many times, is... You guys are quiet today. Jesus is God. Thank you. And now we've learned that the Holy Spirit is... God, yes, and he's a person. I mean, how awesome is our God? Three separate persons, but one unified God. And, and now I'm not going to get into the Trinity today because we don't have two hours and it's going to take longer than that. You're going to spend your lives discovering that. But I just want, to, want you to know that right here in Acts, here's the proof of the Trinity, if someone ever asked you, that the Holy Spirit himself is God. So if God is living inside the believer, then what we need to do is, point number two, understand the seriousness of the God that lives inside of you. So we've just read that the Holy Spirit is God and he can be lied to. And look what happened in the story. Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit. What happened? He died. (laughs) Right? He died on the spot. He dropped dead. His wife lied to the Holy Spirit for going along with her husband's lie. What happened to her? She died right on the spot. Do you guys think that's, that's serious? If you're lying to the Holy Spirit, do you think that, you know, dying is something serious that could happen? Absolutely. So God does take his church very seriously. Remember all that was going on before this happened. The church was just starting out. Miracles and great things were happening. The church was growing. People were repenting and and people were getting saved. The church was a witness to the world around of how the good news of Christ could change a person. By allowing these two people to die, by actually killing these people, the Holy Spirit was protecting the witness of the church and purifying the church. And and that's what he still does today. The power living inside the believer is not only radically changing people on the inside, it's also protecting the church. And and God will protect his church. He'll not let sin go unexposed. He's going to uphold the witness of his people in the world. And guys, we do. We just need to understand the seriousness of the God that lives inside of you. And so far we've seen we need to learn to radically meet the needs of others and understand the seriousness of the God that lives inside you. So the answer, uh, the question is, how should that affect us? How is that going to affect you today? So let's go back to our passage in Acts 5 and verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. So do you think it's fair to say that you would be afraid if you saw some people drop dead in front of you? Yes. I mean, two people just literally dropped dead in front of the church. And so the news of that probably traveled pretty quickly. And and people knew it was serious. God takes his church very seriously. And we need to take it seriously as well. Point number three, and this is the most important thing. If you guys haven't heard anything today, this is important. It's actually life or death. Point number three, you need to react to what you've heard here today. I mean, this message requires a reaction from each and every one of you. So if you're a follower of Jesus here today, this should really just cause you to examine yourself and how you've been living your Christian life. Are you looking out for the needs of others? Uh, You know, are you looking out for those needs before yourself? Are you living in unity with your brothers and sisters in Christ or even with your brothers and sisters at home? I mean, maybe not perfectly, but your desire should be to have that unity. Does your life reflect a life that is being empowered by the Holy Spirit? Galatians 5.16 says... Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And 525 says this, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step or walk with the Spirit. As if you're not walking in the Spirit in your life, your life's going to look a certain way. The example is what we saw in the first part of this message, right? The early church was living this way. They were giving to each other. 
nobody had a need. They were of one mind, one soul. They had everything in common. And there was uh, signs and wonders going on by the apostles. And, and this is what belonging to a church is about. So the reaction you should have if you're a Christian today is one of praise to God that your life would reflect that. But there is another reaction you should have. And I, and I want you guys to pay close attention to this. Remember at the beginning how I asked you guys who your favorite actors were, right? So what does this have to do with our passage? Have you ever heard of the word hypocrite? Anybody heard of the word hypocrite? Okay, a lot of hands are going up. What do you think this means? What do you think hypocrite means? That's a really good answer. They make up a rule, but they don't follow that rule. What do you say? Being selfish? Well, I mean, that could be a hypocrite, but I think that's closer. Go ahead. That's it's tell someone not to do something, and then they do it anyway. So those are all really good answers. The, the word actually comes from two Greek words. Hupo, which means under, and krinian, which means to decide or judge. Put together, the word is hupo krinestai, which means to play the part or pretend. And that's what they actually called actors back in the time of the Greeks or the time of the Bible here. So you guys can tell your parents that you learned some Greek today, um, that you learned what a hypocrite was, but it was actually back then it was a good thing to be an actor. Now we've had it, it's a negative thing, right? So we use that to, to describe a person who says one thing and does another, just like you guys said. This person's a fake or a phony. And that's exactly what Ananias and Sapphira were doing. They were pretending to make themselves something great and make themselves look better in front of the church to get recognition for themselves instead of giving glory to God. And that's exactly why God had to, to make an example of them. He will not have that kind of conduct in his church. He's going to expose it. So I need to ask you, is that you today? Are you living a fake Christian life? Are you doing things so you'll get recognized in front of your friends or parents and look better than you really are? Remember when I said a couple weeks back, it's easy to be a Christian on Sunday morning, right? You can live and look really good. That's because there's a lot of actors here. There are a lot of fake believers. You know, and if I'm describing you today, your reaction should be to repent. This is sin. You may be hiding things from your friends or family, but you're not hiding anything from God. You guys, flip over to Psalm 139. I, I want you to see this with your own eyes. I'll give you a second to get there. If you guys uh, need to help someone next to you find it. What's Psalm 139? <laughs> and, and I'm going to, it's going to be up on the screen as well. All right, I'm going to, are most of you guys there? Okay, here, here's what Psalm 39 says. I want you to look at this while I read it. It's Psalm 139 says this, guys. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Listen to this. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your, pan, your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? Guys, God knows every thought and every word before you even say it. He knows you're not fooling him. The best actors can't fool God. 
This is hypocrisy. So, guys, you need to react to what you've heard today. You have no more excuses. You now know what the Word of God says. And, and here's the beauty of it, guys. Here's the good news. God can help you live the life that's pleasing to him. You, you can't even do this on your own. He didn't live, leave you here alone to figure it out. He left, as we heard in our story, the Holy Spirit. You guys hear that? If you are a Christian, you have God in the form of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He's the helper that Jesus promised, who'd always be with the believer. He's there to help. There's also a third category. It doesn't even demand a reaction. It does because it's the person who doesn't care, who doesn't want to believe in God. If, you're, if that's you today, then you're just coming because your parents made you come or whatever, and you're not a Christian, it's time for you to react as well. You know, God is calling you. you. You've heard the truth that Jesus came and died on the cross for sin. And that he's calling you to repent of your sin and believe in him. If you're in that category who just don't, don't care at all, look, I'm begging you today to believe in Jesus and follow him. Let the Holy Spirit come and live inside you. And if this is something that you don't know about, or if you're that fake believer, I want you guys to talk to your group leader today. Ask your parents, ask a pastor, ask me, how can I repent and follow Jesus? I mean, there are these categories that we talked about today, those who know God and those who don't or pretend they do. Which one are you? Which one are you? How will you walk today? Let me pray.